Welcome to the Episcopal Church of the Holy Communion. Thank you for joining us for this sermon. You can find all of our sermons at holycommunion.net and our Facebook, YouTube, and podcast channels. Consider hitting like or subscribe. Consider sharing this sermon with others. It helps us to reach more people like you. We are so thankful to those who support our ministry. You can give today at holycommunion.net backslash give. I love this passage from 1 Kings because it has to be the most endearingly prosaic theophany in the Bible. Many times in Scripture, people's encounters with God or God's messengers are grand and stirring. There are flashing lights, wheels in the sky, chariots of fire, angels walking around inside fiery furnaces, or a multitude of the heavenly host in the skies, proclaiming the glory of God. Not for Elijah. His angel functions something like a cross between a rude alarm clock and a nagging parent. No greetings, highly favored one, like Mary God, or holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, like Isaiah heard, Elijah's angel says, get up and eat. That's it. That's the entirety of the message. Get up and eat. Elijah, worn out, downtrodden, ready to give up, lies down to die. To be fair, he's being slightly melodramatic, angsting around the wilderness. But the angel of the Lord is having none of it. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. Part of why I love this text is that neither Elijah nor we want God to communicate with us like this. We want the lights and fireworks, or at least something poetic and beautiful. Give us a gorgeous sunset and the words of the 23rd Psalm, at the very least. Give us an overwhelming sense of eternal love, and behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Get up and eat? That's hardly reassuring or even encouraging. It's so normal, so basic. God might as well remind us to quit losing our car keys and take out the trash while God's at it. It reminds me of a parishioner I once had who told me that she wished God would quit hinting that she mop her floors more often. This thoroughly pedestrian revelation in the first half of our reading comes before the much more famous second part, the still small voice. Just a few verses later, we read, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, He wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Then Elijah tells God about how hard things have been, how everyone is out to kill him. And then God gives him his next steps, that he is to go and anoint some leaders. This second part of the story is the story we know, and it's the story we like. It's beautiful, it's grand, and it challenges us just enough. We're asked to remember that God's voice is not heard in the crashing chaos of grandiose spiritual expectations, but instead in a disciplined listening in prayer, beneath the noise of our frantic minds and hectic everyday lives. But what's fascinating is that Elijah was not ready for the mountaintop encounter at first. He was a hot mess. He was hungry and tired, 
and not taking care of himself. He was lost in the wilderness, both the literal wilderness of the countryside and the inner wilderness of dying vocation. He was ready to give up. He couldn't have withstood the earthquake, the fire, and the wind, and he certainly was in no shape to hear God in the silence. And so an angel had to show up and get him back on track, back to basics. Get up and eat. It may not seem very inspiring, but it may be just the message we need to hear. And hearing and responding to our call to ministry is very relevant to us in this time of re-emerging church in the tail end of pandemic. What is your call to serve here and now? How have you discerned it? Notice that I don't say you are to discern if or whether you are called to serve. I'm saying from this borrowed pulpit that if you're over the age of five, you are 100% called to serve in this spiritual community. It may be in a way you've already served for years, altar guild, acolytes, building and grounds, or maybe a completely new way as a Sunday school teacher, youth group leader, outreach program coordinator, and intercessor. Your call will correspond to your gifts and abilities. If you are at an age where you do not drive after dark, you are not called to a ministry that will require that. If you love the outdoors and hate numbers and math, there's a better chance you're called to garden ministry than to the finance committee. Listen to your life and let it speak God's call to you. As the famous Frederick Buechner quote says, find the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger intersect. That is your call. But if all of that sounds a bit intimidating, a bit tiring, discerning your vocation with a capital V, just start with the angel's advice. Get up and eat. God knows I need to hear this advice and follow it more often. Take care of yourself. Have you thought of self-care as a key ingredient to discernment? As you're trying to understand how God is calling you to ministry, have you paid any attention to how well you're looking after the basic necessities of physical and spiritual life? What does it mean for us to get up and eat as the angel commands? Well, let's take it down to brass tacks. Eat good, healthful food to whatever extent you can financially afford to do that. Get enough sleep. Exercise in a way that feels joyful to you. Drink enough water. Don't drink too much alcohol. There you go. Physical basics. Then we have some emotional well-being basics, like talking about our experiences with others, spending time with a therapist if need be, and so forth. Notice that I am not talking about the self-care industrial complex, which is forever trying to sell us more products that are promised to help us prioritize our self-care. These are usually pretty thinly veiled attempts of capitalism to co-opt the language that began in social justice movements to help frontline protesters survive nonviolent resistance actions long enough to make a difference. No marginalized person ever bubble bathed their way into a changed world. Lighting a scented candle and binge watching a show over a pint of ice cream may be fun and even good to do after a rough day. But that's not self-care in the deep sense. The sense that equips you to resist the powers and principalities. Real self-care, the type Elijah's angel is talking about, is something much deeper and much more demanding. And most of the time, it's not going to result in an Instagram post. And for as much as we see the self-care language floating around the Episcopal Church, we don't often talk about or practice real spiritual self-care. What does that look like? Well, reading our Bible daily. Spending time set aside in prayer every day, more than just quick memos to God with requests tossed off on the run. 
coming to worship regularly, finding some way to express love for another person every day, talking with someone else and listening to someone else about something deeper than baseball or the weather, wondering together what God is up to. Those are the basics of spiritual well-being. That's what the angel means when she says, get up and eat. So I invite you to pay attention this week to how you're doing with those basics. And if there's an area you need some work on, ask for help. Put in some time. And then see if the channels of spiritual communication between you and God start to get a little bit clearer. If you care for yourself well, you'll feel better. And if you feel better, new and deeper ministry seems more possible, more sustainable, even exciting. If you're ready to lie down and die when you think about ministry, like Elijah, you need an angel of the Lord to tap you on the shoulder and say, get up and eat. Consider this sermon, that wake-up call. I need it myself. So, I'm going on retreat next week to fill up my spiritual tank, to spend the time in scripture and silence and prayer I need to recenter myself. And I recognize the immense privilege that allows me the time to go and do that. If your life is crazy, and your economic stress doesn't give you much space for contemplation and prayer. Know that God loves you exactly where you are and welcomes whatever offering of attention you can bring. The widow's might of prayer and Bible study is more worthy than any pharisaical showy display of piety. If you're going to answer the call of the still small voice, the call to commit to new and exciting ministry at Holy Communion, first you have to answer the call to get up and eat. You have to equip your body, your mind, your heart to receive God's guidance. And you can answer the command to get up and eat right here in this worship service. In just a few moments, you will be literally invited to get up and eat. The communion table will be spread. And the living bread of heaven, Jesus, our sustenance and our life, will be given to you in Holy Communion. The stakes are high. The world around us needs us to serve with courage and generosity. The angel, the second time he wakes Elijah up, says, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. The journey of ministry is challenging, and we have to walk into that with our eyes wide open. But Jesus promises us that if we do get up and eat, if we do receive his grace and love every day in the most humble and practical of ways, we will be filled and sustained by the Holy Spirit. I am the bread of life, he says. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Today, here, together, let us answer the call to get up and eat. Then tomorrow, we will be able to feed the world. Amen. Amen.